either haven't put it down since it was released, or you're so tired of seeing it on your social media feed. Either way, I hope you tune in for just one more video, or put down your controller for just a moment to tune into this Assassin's Creed Valhalla review. The reason I think it's going to be a little different, while yes, we're going to be doing gameplay, visuals, music, storytelling, all those things, this is also coming from the perspective of a Norse pagan. As someone that has read many books on Norse mythology, as someone that has been part of this faith for quite a while now, and is curious to see how this game represents the religious aspects of the Viking people. I would also like to mention that this review, along with all future game reviews I do, will be on the website called Midgardian. Um, it launches on December 15th, and it's going to be kind of this hub for all heathen and northern religion-based content. We'll be doing reviews and a unique post on a monthly basis, um, so hopefully you come in and check it out on December 15th. I have written this review to be completely spoiler-free, except one thing that I have to bring up when talking about the pagan content. So there will be a slight spoiler. It's not a huge one. I won't go into too much detail, but I will have to bring it up. But I am doing my best to make sure this is spoiler-free as possible. But I'm going to go ahead and move into some gameplay footage and talk about my review for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So to England, glory and destiny. To England. To England! The story takes place over quite a grand campaign, spanning dozens of hours, and in one video I will barely be able to scratch the surface of all the story arcs. But quite simply, you are a Viking who comes to England to make a name for him or herself, participating in many theaters of war to achieve glory for yourself and your clan. My only complaint with the story is the opening act before you leave Norway. It felt rushed, moving from your childhood to your adult life to you getting revenge for the father you barely cared about on a villain who you really had no time to hate. Before leaving a town, I barely had time to fall in love with. I did not feel the emotional weight of leaving Norway because of how many blows to the face I got in the opening hours. But the biggest question that needs to be answered is does the story work and is it engaging? And I believe the answer is yes. I found the story to be highly engaging once you get to England, with many fantastic plot points to make you crave the next big moment. But I believe the true power of this game is the story that happens in between these larger set pieces. The map is littered with these small mysteries, as they call them, that often come down to one to two minute quests that are often hilarious. One that stands out to me is I, I found this warrior who has an axe lodged into his head and he's completely unaware of it. And it leads to this dark comedic moment where you as the player have to decide if you tell him about the axe protruding into his skull, or if you lie to him to comfort him in his death. Be from my most recent battle. You should see the other man. He got the worst of it. Worse than... I suppose it's possible, yes? If he's headless? My arms are numb from battle. Does it need any dressing? I could honestly name off at least a dozen of these small mysteries that left a smile on my face or even made me chuckle a little bit out loud. These small moments are further made better by the extremely long list of well-written side characters, ranging from these small mystery encounters all the way to the companions you pick up along the way. While some of these great characters are not given a lot of dialogue to work with in a game that spans well over 60 hours in one playthrough, the amount of memorable characters really is quite impressive. With enough small twists and turns to keep you on your feet from larger story sections, I never found myself getting bored of the conversations between characters that drove the plot. Assassin's Creed Valhalla continues the sci-fi ancient alien lore that has slowly taken a step back in the series over the years. We see this even further in Assassin's Creed Valhalla with minimal animus slash real world moments to take you away from the main Viking story. I also found that the Order of the Ancients slash the Hidden Ones, which is really just the Assassins versus the Templar in a different skin, was really just interesting enough to keep me engaged, but not so overbearing that it took away from the Viking story I was really looking for. I've been playing Assassin's Creed Valhalla on a PS4 Pro. And my experience has been incredible visually. The HDR that comes through every time the sun sets or rises in the game is a sight to be seen. I found myself pausing on multiple occasions just to watch the sunset over the mountains in the distance. That being said, I'm sure the experience is even better on the PS5 or the new Xbox Series X. However, I have not heard good things from my friends who are playing this on the released versions of the PS4 and the Xbox One. While I've not seen their versions with my eye, I've heard they are quite disappointing. 
The real star of the show is, of course, the music. Many of us in the pagan community know that a legend who is Einar Selvig is one of the minds behind the soundtrack of Assassin's Creed Valhalla, and it does not disappoint. From the combat music to every story mission's theme, the music really knows how to hit hard in certain moments. But just as with the story, I find myself praising the smaller moments, moments where I would be walking around a village and hear a child hum the beat of a song, or hearing men sing songs around a fire. Furthermore, Einar takes the form of a character on your crew by the name of Braggy. He tells stories and sings acoustic songs on your voyage up and down the rivers in England. And honestly, this was such a surprise and such a great treat to add to this game. While you're sailing up these rivers, your eyes are going to be treated to a wide variety of locations to explore. From the monasteries you raid, ancient Roman ruins you explore, to the small pagan sites you find scattered throughout the land. Each territory offers something different than the last. While your starting area is very classical England, fields and rolling hills, you will also explore marshes to the south and highlands to the north. It really is a treat to explore every corner of the game world. There's a lot to talk about in gameplay. Some great, some not so much. The thing that took me a while to get used to was the combat. Coming from Assassin's Creed Odyssey is very different, but for returning fans that enjoy the older combat system, they should find themselves quite happy here. Assassin's Creed has changed a lot over the last decade, and the good of all those changes are here. The items, abilities, and skill trees are all here from previous entries, just a little different. The skill tree in particular is one of the most daunting skill trees I've seen in a AAA game. At its core, it's three branching pathways, but when you begin to dig deeper, you'll find it is a web of interlocking trees, easily spanning hundreds of different improvements. The abilities gained here only enhance the normal actions of Eivor, while the abilities you find from ancient tomes in the world are what you'll be assigning to your eight ability slots. I found the majority of these tome abilities to be lackluster, especially since you don't know what ability you're going to be getting from which skill book. I found myself using the same two pretty regularly, simply because they do the most damage for the cost of one adrenaline bubble. Combat itself did grow on me, and I quickly became the viking killing machine this game demands me to be. The only challenge I experienced in the game came from my own doing, when I would try to take on missions or areas that were drastically higher than my own level. If you stick to the areas that are meant for your level, you will find little to no challenge outside of how fast you can kill the next mob. No Assassin's Creed game is complete without stealth, and here it has never been more optional. You will have many of the same mechanics you have grown used to, as well as some returning features such as crowd blending. While it can be fun to see every encounter like a puzzle of how can I not get detected and complete the objective, however I found it much easier just to charge right into the middle of a situation and take on the horde of enemies in one big fight. Long story short, the stealth is here if you want to use it. But to me, it's more of a novelty than a necessary gameplay feature, as the series turns more into an action RPG instead of a stealth assassin game. Also, no Assassin's Creed game is complete without a great number of bugs and gameplay hiccups. While not the worst the series has experienced, I'm looking at you Assassin's Creed Unity, they are still here, and they have some kick to them at times. I've experienced at least three full crashes with no data loss, However, I have several friends who have lost hours of gameplay due to some of these crashes. Most bugs are ignorable, however, some are just upsetting. I have one crew member of my long ship that refuses to stay on the ship every time I assign him. He will no longer be there when I fast travel. Now, this is a minor thing, but still, this is one of the characters I was looking forward to most raiding with, and he will never join my raiding parties, and it's just, it's just upsetting. On the topic of raids, they are here, and they let you live the Viking power fantasy that you've always wanted. The two-way road system between monasteries and your village is a fun way to encourage raids. However, if I was not invested in upgrading my Viking village, I would ignore the monastery raids after the first few hours. You quickly realize that these raids are all about the same, and they lose their luster fairly quickly, at least in my playthrough. There are a lot of gameplay systems in this game I can't cover in just one video. There are a huge amount of collectibles, legendary animals to hunt, ruins to explore, and activities that add filler to this already massive game. I can see a completionist playthrough easily taking over 120 hours. Oh, gods. I hate long speeches. Only when you're not giving them. I was not going to originally talk about the historical accuracy of this game, as it's not something I was really looking for when going into it. 
However, I've been asked by so many people through my playthrough, how is the historical accuracy? And I don't have good news for you. The game is a Viking power fantasy, and that's about it. While the backdrop of the action and the names of characters and cities are well done, it seems like that is where the research ended. The game is still at its core an Assassin's Creed game, with their own take on history and their own sci-fi fantasy elements driving a lot of the main actions of a lot of characters. Now, I don't think this should turn anyone from the game, and my argument for that is that historically accurate games tend to be less fun. I have much respect for games like Kingdom Come Deliverance, as it is a marvel in game engineering at being one of the most realistic sword and shield RPGs available, but it's also a chore to play. Assassin's Creed Valhalla will not itch your need for a historically accurate experience, but it is a fun game, and we have to remember our knowledge of the Viking Age is incomplete, and it would be near impossible to create a game that as perfectly shows the life as a Viking Raider, simply because we do not have the information to create such a game. Characters like Ivar the Boneless, who is represented in a very interesting way in this game, would be incredibly flat because our knowledge of him is quite limited. I will say this game could have had a little bit more historical information to back some of its story moments. However, at the end of the day, this game is not marketed as a historically accurate game. It is marketed as a Viking power fantasy, and I think it achieves that quite well. Sigurd! What has... what has happened? This was not for you, Javi. what I believe will set this review apart from others. Does this game succeed in my eyes as a good heathen game? And I'm going to go out on a limb here and not only say it does succeed, but I believe it is the best representation of pre-Christian Scandinavian religion in any video game, and perhaps any other form of media, especially since this is a AAA title that is already breaking sales records for the series. I do have my complaints, and it is not perfect, but I really do believe no one has shown it this well in a video game. This is where the slight spoilers come in, and it's that you get to travel to Asgard through visions. While you're here, you are allowed to participate in several stories from the Poetic Edda, leading up to the events of Ragnarok. While these are not perfect tellings, they are still a huge win for practitioners and Norse mythology enthusiasts alike. It's not just the larger stories, but there are several mysteries, just like you'd find in the real game world, that let you participate in small events that represent lore within the Norse myths. You are allowed to interact with many gods, including Thor, Freya, Loki, Tyr, and Jord. Now, some of the voice acting is a little wonky on the gods. Maybe it's because I have this idea of what I think they would sound like, and characters like Loki sound a little odd, at least in my opinion. What do you know of honor, Freya? You've bedded more men than all the halls in Midgard. You're a fine one to talk of sexual appetites. You fathered a wolf cub. If you look at these stories and the Asgard plotline as a whole, with a magnifying glass, they will not stand up at all. The dialogue does not match up with the edit poems, they clearly put enough lines to make the connection, but quickly move into their own dialogue. One of the moments I did want to bring up, just to show you that this game is not perfect, is when a character is drawing a rune and they mention the rune Ewas for protection, and then they draw a Rytho rune, or a Rytho rune, and it left many of us in the community scratching our heads, especially since we knew Crawford was behind this. It seems like the game designers just kind of went for it in this instance and maybe didn't consult the right expert, and it really shows through to anyone that knows anything about runes. But still, this game is a massive step up from what we've had before. Most importantly to me, these stories are portrayed in a positive light for the most part. While the gods are flawed, we expect that. We can still see the lessons behind each of these stories, and that to me is what is most important. As is the theme of this review, to me the true beauty is in the details. While the Asgard section is great, the true power of the story comes from the characters you meet along the way. I heard characters talking about offerings they gave to the gods. I witnessed how a Dane handles grief of a loved one. Throughout the campaign and Eivor's interactions with NPCs, he will occasionally give advice in the form of lines from the Havamal. This is a really cool thing to witness as you're sitting there listening to these conversations and you're like, wait, that's from the Avamal. It is a really cool moment when these things come up. There's also a huge emphasis on the honor code of warriors, and many of the mystery events have small god lessons hidden within them. We have a long way to go as far as accuracy and representation of Nordic mythology and stories, 
But the fact that this game doesn't make paganism look bad in the end is really a sign of how far Viking representation of media has grown up. In my review, I get two scores. One based on the game itself, and one score based on the pagan content. In reflection of the past representations of Viking slash pagan media and video games, we are left with a really short list of titles. Most recently you have God of War, Hellblade, and Crusader Kings, but none of these games quite capture what it would be like to worship these gods in a real world sense. And Assassin's Creed Valhalla is a huge step forward in pagan representation in modern media. While it may not be the historical representation some people were hoping for, I do believe this game succeeds in many things, and I still have to give this game a pagan score of 3 out of 5. With minor complaints and early day hiccups aside, this game is a wonderful action RPG, with moments of true heart and a world of beauty. I found myself still wanting to dive into the next story mission even after playing for 8 hours straight. For this, I have to give the game a review of 4.5 out of 5. I hope you enjoyed my review of Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Now, I will be doing more game reviews of past games involving Norse mythology and Norse-related content, but these will only be available on the Midgardian website launching on December 15th. So I hope to see you there, and until the hall, Skull.